Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Faith. I'm a very grateful member of the al family group. Um, I want to thank, I made some notes to myself because the last time um, I spoke in Little Rock, is anybody here from Little Rock, Arkansas? Uh, I didn't make any notes, and I left out several things that I wanted to share, plus I was sick. And uh, I think the, the planes must, I, like this morning, I, my head is all stuffy and my ears are kind of closed. So first of all, I want to uh, I want to thank the committee. The committee has done an excellent job. You have made Mike and I feel very, very much at home. And that's nice. I thank Lynn. She was there at the airport, and uh, she called me a couple times. We missed a couple times, and then I called her back. Clark wrote to me, uh, I think, uh, three, four times. And I just felt like I was a part of this long before I got here. And I want to, I want to thank the committee very much for that. Uh, my home group, by the way, is a new beginning group. In, uh, we meet in Noblesville, Indiana. And that's about uh, 45 minutes north of uh, Indianapolis. And then you go about seven miles uh, east. So if anybody's familiar with that uh, area, Noble's, I think I met somebody uh-huh. yesterday who was familiar. Come up and see it. One of the things I wanted to mention when uh, when I talked to Lynn the, the last time when she was, uh, she wanted to know if we were going to fly into St. Louis or Kansas City. And I said, uh, well, I gave, I sent my itinerary to Clark, and we're not flying into either one. And there was silence. But we're coming, we're flying into Columbia. And I said, we're going to fly on one of those little commuter planes. I guess you call them what? Puddle jumpers? Mm-hmm. And right away, typical Al-Anon. At first I thought pre al She said, oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't fly one of those. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I made a wrong decision. I may not even make it. <laughs> you know, so. Um, Ernie shared last night about the, the film Bill Field of Green, and that here uh, it was um, a place where dreams come true. And I'll, I'll tell you what, that kind of touched my heart. But really, a lot of things that he shared touched my heart. Because he shared some things that I'm going to share with you the feelings about how he felt when he was growing up. And you know, Al Anon, I think this is the hardest thing of the Al Anon program for me to do, is to share in front of a group. When I'm talking to a new person, I can talk and talk and talk and talk. But when they ask me to do this, it's probably one of the hardest things for me to do because I am not real good about talking about myself. And I always say, you know, why do they ask me? Why don't they ask Mike? Because I'll tell you, Mike says, I love talking. And I'm thinking he's an alcoholic. <laughs> you know? I learned that there are three things that you need to do to capture the audience. Um... You need to pass something out. Well, I don't have anything to pass out to you because I don't have that much stuff, you know. I was passing out peanuts or whatever. I don't have enough for all. And then you're to pick on somebody and you're to tell a joke. Well, I'm not good at telling jokes, but I have learned this from alcoholics. See, when I came in now and I was real serious, mm-hmm. you know, and I learned about a sense of humor from you guys and you gals in AA, and I love it. And I'm, I'm so glad that I'm getting better at that. So first of all, though, I'm going to pick on somebody. And I'll pick on my husband. Mike, would you stand up? Let everybody see you're the reason I'm here. (laughs) Now, the joke is, this man walks into a bar. Oh, really, there's a little bit more to that. This man walks into a bar, and he looks around, and he's the only one in the bar. And he bellies up to the... the bar there on bar stool, and he looks at the end of the, of the bar, and there's the bartender. You know, he makes a little bit of noise to get his attention, and then all of a sudden he hears this voice say, hey, that nice looking shirt you've got on you. He looks around, he doesn't see anybody, there's no one there. He waits a few seconds. You sure have nice eyes. Now he's the end of things, he's hearing things, right? So he looks around, he looks over the bar, doesn't see anybody. So he scurries down the end of the bar, 
He said, you know, maybe it's just my imagination. I hear these voices. And the bartender says, that's okay. It's just the nuts. They're complimentary. <laughs> no, I'm just a nut and I'm complimentary, you know. <laughs> I want to tell you, it's a, it's been, I'll get a little emotional. I know I will. I always do. And I, and I wish I'd have that on my queen. Um, <clears throat> Mike is a past delegate, um, area 46, panel 23. Do I have it right? I never get it right to a three verse. It's area 23, panel 46. Um, Mike was the delegate, uh, I believe, in 96 and 97. So the first year that he was delegate, he wanted to know if I wanted to go, and I said, no, I really don't think that I can afford to go. You see, in our house, we are somewhat self-supporting. Some of you gals and guys may not like to hear that, but we are in our home. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, you're going to be 50 years old. That already tells you how old I'm going to be next month, Okay. So I'll give it to you for your 50th birthday. And I said, okay. He said, but you have to take care of all the other expenses. I said, all right. I, I can do that, and I think I can get off work. I'm so glad that I went, because the first year, uh, they took the um, they took all of us, I think there was maybe seven busloads, to Steppington. And also, al was moving their headquarters from New York to Virginia Beach. And see, if I hadn't have gone, then I would have missed that. So I thank Mike for encouraging me to do that. I really believe that Mike and I carry a message together unlike we carry apart. Because you see, for me, Alan has saved my life. AA has saved Mike's life. There's no doubt in my mind. But Alan saved my life. And I'll probably, Alan saved my marriage. Because there wasn't much of a marriage left when I got here, as I'll share with you in a little bit. But anyway, we found ourselves standing in this kitchen of, of stepping stones, small kitchen, very conservative home. They live very conservative, conservative Lois and Bill Wilson. And the, and the coffee pot was on the stove, and the faucet was dripping, and there were like three sta- three uh, chairs there in the kitchen. And out of maybe 80 people, Mike and I were in that kitchen for a few moments by ourselves. And I looked at him, and he looked at me. And I knew that we were where we were supposed to be. And I have gotten to love Al and I every year that I'm in Al and I. And I'm more than just in it. I'm a part of it, which keeps us very busy. It keeps me very busy. Um, two weeks before we came here, we had our uh, Al and convention. And then we had uh, the five state uh, convention, AA convention. Two weeks ago, and then last week was a was Alan on the very first international, which I did not uh, get to attend. Did anybody here get to attend the international hour? Great. Please, before today or tomorrow's over, um, get with me. I, I just want to talk to you, and just you know, because I didn't get to go. I always thank Alcoholics Anonymous from the bottom of my heart, because you see, if it weren't for Alcoholics Anonymous, there wouldn't be an Alan on. And I think sometimes we forget about that. And, and I know at home sometimes uh, we forget about that. I don't forget about that. If it weren't for Bill Wilson encouraging Lois to find a program for the family members, the loved ones who suffered by somebody else's drinking, we would not have a program of recovery today. Because, you see, she was 60 years old when he encouraged her to do this. He had made a trip in Canada. She wasn't able to go with him. And there were family members that had approached him. Do you have a program for those who have suffered from somebody else's drinking? And he said no. So when he came back home, he said, you know, it's very important that you do this. And all she wanted to do was to retire, spend her retiring years in their very first home, which is Bedford Hill, at Stepping Stone, and grow flowers, because she loved to grow flowers. And you know, I don't think I would have been near that level. I don't think if I were 60 years old that I would do that. I don't know, but I just don't think I would. But she was very loving, and Ann Bingham was very loving. And then both of them started in the upstairs of that home. And we have a brand new pamphlet, just came out a few months ago, talking about these very ordinary women, Ann Bingham and Lois Wilson, who have an extraordinary message. And that's a very, I'm glad that we have that, because we have very little of that they continue to print at WSO with our history. So if you haven't seen that pamphlet, get it and read it. It's, I enjoy that. I enjoy talking about the history 
of both programs now. <laughs> um, when I first got here, of course, I didn't. I didn't want anything to do with the 12 steps. They say, and I love your thing, our 12-step work. The 12 steps, I didn't know anything about it. It scared me to death. And then when I learned about it, I didn't. Oh, I'm not doing that. And then when I worked them and applied them to my life, it gave me a solution to live life today. I love it. I'm going to read something for you uh, from a, a piece of literature, again, al non literature, that is no longer published, probably because it didn't sell. See if some of you relate to this. This is a description of, a wi- of the wife of an alcoholic. She has headaches because she can't figure things out. Heart spasms because her heart is in her mouth from fear. Nausea because she is fed up. Back aches because she can't bear it. Foot trouble because she can't stand it. Bladder and kidney problems because she can't let go. (laughs) Well, that certainly fit in me. And you know what it talks about is how we feel, how we felt. And when I was growing up, I grew up in a household where children should be seen and not heard. There was a lot of body language in our home. And there were six of us, six children. And none of us were, we, we were half brothers and sisters. Well, I had two brothers and three sisters. And you know, you know, the thing that I learned is that no matter if we were dying, we wouldn't have helped one another because probably we didn't know how. There wasn't a lot of laughter. There wasn't a lot of nurturing. I had a stepfather that was foreign to me. My mother was somebody that I always held up on a pedestal, and all I ever wanted my mother to do was to tell me that she loved me and that she was proud of me, and that never happened. I remember when I was about seven years old, this lady, I probably was six or seven years old, this lady would come to school, and she would visit me. And I don't know how many times she would visit me, but she would visit me periodically. And I liked the way she looked. She was pretty. I liked the way she smelled. She brought me butterscotch candy. She brought me crayons, and she brought me coloring books. And I thought she cared about me. And I wanted my mother to care about me the way that I thought she cared about me. And I really think this lady did. She stopped coming to school to see me abruptly, and I couldn't figure out why. What I found out was that she was a social worker. My mother told me this later on. And the reason she stopped coming to see me, evidently my mother had to know about this or give permission, that they started sending the social worker to talk to me before they had gotten permission from my family, from my mother. And she said, you are not to tell these family secrets. And I thought, what family secrets am I I telling? But I was learning, you don't talk about what goes on behind closed doors. So it was as though I had to live two different lives. One behind the doors, not much nurturing, not much love, and then another one outside the world. And I remember then when I was about 13 years old, and by this time my mother had gotten involved in a very strict fundamental religion, and it it was like we went to 90 meetings in a week. And I thought, that's all we did. We'd go to these meetings, and, you know, they talked about being perfect, and they talked about not thinking bad thoughts, and they talked about not saying bad words. And you see, sometimes I thought bad thoughts. And sometimes I said bad words. And I thought, God is going to get me. He's punishing God. Then Ernie kind of touched on last night. And that was the kind of God that I knew. And many times I would wake up in the middle of the night and I thought, oh my God, I forgot to say my prayers. I better get down. I better say my prayers or he's going to get me. That's what I did. And I would be so tired, but I would be so full of fear. I had a lot of fear in me. I didn't know that until I got there. And I'm going to speed up now until I'm about 16 years old. And I'm still in this strict fundamental religion. And I want to, I want to go back to when I, when I, when I was 13, that something that happened that started, um, I started a little bit of resentment toward my mother when I was about seven, when that social worker was stopped and she couldn't come to see me. But then, this particular day, these ladies who were involved in the church, my mother couldn't go for some reason, so she allowed me to go. And I thought, you know, that's kind of neat. And I said something like, I can't get my homework done because I've got too much housework to do. My mother's working out of the home now. And I'm watching my brother and my sister. And if they do something wrong, I get punished because I'm in charge of them. I'm being responsible. 
we got back home and I thought everything was fine. This lady kind of let it slip that we had this little discussion. And right away, when my mom looked at me and you, the first time I remember, the first time I remember in my gut, that nauseous, sick, lonely, fearful feeling. And I thought, I don't want these ladies to leave because I know when they leave I'm going to be punished terribly. My mother was so angry. I, don't, I never recalled her being this angry. Why why I remember that? Of course, you know, life goes on. They left. My mother took me in the house, took me in their bedroom, and down out of the closet of my stepfather was a big, thick, black leather strap. And she took that strap down, and I had shorts on. It was summertime. But she continued to hit me on the leg. I kept praying, please, God, help her. Stop. Let her stop. Let her stop. And I remember the belt buckle hit my legs and whelped on my legs and blood came to the surface and I remember I had to wear heavy cords for several days for my legs to heal but what I remember not so much that but what I remember is don't you dare don't you dare shake those speak don't you dare talk about what goes on behind these doors don't you dare that's what I remember and I was so afraid so I really learned how to pretend and I learned how to live in a fantasy world you know, Mike says to me this morning, he said, listen, I know you're nervous. But all you have to do is you go in that room, and the reason I'm telling you is because I know he wanted me to tell you. You just tell him how charming I am and how loving I am and how sweet I am. And I'm thinking, honey, you're living in that fantasy world that I sometimes live in. So you see, when those things happened to me, I did live in a fantasy world. But I wanted it to be just like fathers knows best. That's what I really wanted it to be, and why couldn't it be in my house? My classmates seemed to be happy, seemed to be doing things fine. Why wasn't the same thing going on in my home? I didn't know that it was a sick home. I was comparing my life with everybody else's life. And I thought it was my fault because things weren't, not, weren't good for me. When I was about 16 years old, in this fundamental religion, we were at this gathering, and I saw this guy at the other, you know, just kind of glimpsed, saw him at the other end of the room. And somebody said, that's Mike Smith, and, well, it's Mike Smith, and he's in New York, and, oh, well, then that kind of got my attention. And then somebody says, you know, he's a little worldly, and that kind of got my attention, because he did look a little different than these other guys. And then my mother said, but you don't want to date him. Well, maybe she shouldn't have said that. Maybe I would have never married him. <laughs> you got it for two years we dated and I think we convinced one another that we're going to be happy now my fantasy world was your day you know the white picket fence the white house the green shutters the pretty wife the husband in the white collar the tie one child two child two children we only had one child but I wanted everything perfect. I thought if I just do everything perfectly, that it would be fine. So I thought if I got rid of my family, which, yes, when I agreed to marry him, you know, my mom says, if you marry him, don't you ever, ever think about coming home. And I knew that I could never, ever go home. But I also knew that I loved him enough, and he certainly loved me enough, that I could change anything about him that I wanted to change. <laughs> And you see, I'm not going to tell you the first seven years we were married that it wasn't fun, social drink, because there were some fun times, really, there were. And my oldest brother showed us some fun times, and we ate in some of the finest restaurants. You know, like on Doris Day, you go and you have a white linen tablecloth, and you look in each other's eyes, and there's candlelight, and you have wine. And have maybe a drink before dinner, wine, a drink after dinner. That's what I wanted. And I'd be all pretty, and he would be my knight in shining armor, and that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it was in the movies, right? So every time it didn't work out that way, I thought it'll work out that way the next time. Continued, continued to do the same thing, expecting different results. But that didn't happen, and I did different things. But you know what? What I didn't understand is that every time Mike picked up a drink, that I would react. And I didn't know that I was doing that. What I didn't understand is on Friday night, why he wouldn't at the end of the week 
gets off at 3.30, why wouldn't he want to come home to me? Why would he want to call me and say, well, you know what, I might stop by the bar and have a couple of drinks with the guy. And then I would say, well, what time do you think he'll be home? Well, I should be home about 6 o'clock, so if you get all cleaned up and you get Michelle cleaned up, that's our daughter, um, we'll go out to dinner. And I said, okay. You know, about a month into our wedding, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to do this probably back and forth. I thought, another fantasy thought, I thought the rhythm method would work for me. No. I didn't try the rhythm method. I just thought it would work for me. <laughs> Heck, my God. You know, I think about these things now, and I'm thinking, God, I really was bad. <laughs> so I ended up pregnant, you know, a month later. But we have a daughter who's 32 years old. She'll be 32 years old Monday, by the way. And Mike and I will be celebrating 33 years of marriage. I'd love to say bliss, wonderful bliss. It's September the 4th of this year. So anyway... I couldn't understand why he didn't want to rush right home to me. And so I thought, well, you know, he has a rough week. Maybe it's all right, a couple drinks with a guy, because he said when he gets home, we'll go out to dinner. And you know what? Sometimes he would get home one time, and we would go out to dinner, and we'd have those nice dinners that I talked about, and it was nice. And then sometimes he wouldn't get home until 9, 10, or 11, 12 o'clock. And I'd be angry. And then there would be times that I would get in his face. And he'd say, say, don't, don't get in my face. And boy, I'd just stick my nose right up there and I'd get in his face. And then I had this brilliant idea that if I showed him what it was like to be married to somebody who drank the way he drank, um, maybe he wouldn't drink so much. Because pouring out the booze didn't help. And I didn't do a whole lot of pouring out the booze. I'll be real honest with you. I really didn't do that until the disease had progressed quite a bit before I did that. And I didn't mark the bottle. But I thought if I drank with him, would be less for him to drink. And then I thought if I drank without him and I came in at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning like he did, that he would get the message. Well, let me tell you what happened to me. In this fantasy world that I lived in, I went out at 3 or 4 o'clock and I drank in the white collar bars and Mike drank in the blue collar bars. And I'd call some of those bars and they'd say he wasn't there, but I knew he was there because I was parked right outside. And then he would do the same to me. But when I got home at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, Mike was waiting for me. And he was not pleased. And Mike certainly got into my face. And there was physical violence in our home. Bizarre. Bizarre things went on in our home. You see, we were now becoming two very, very sick people feeding off of one another. And we have very, very strong personalities in our home. Mike has a personality just as strong as mine. And I was bound and determined to be the winner. And he was bound and determined to be the winner. And I thought Mike was out to get me, but I was going to get him first to see the kind of thing you see, what I didn't realize is that when I got married, and I thought that we were going to be very forever happy in this blissful marriage, what I didn't realize is that I took me with me. Remember from that hole? Remember the feelings that I couldn't share? Remember the anger that I talked about and the fear I talked about and the resentment? And what I learned is that re resentment leads to, leads to self-pity and leads to anger. I had all those personality defects, if you will, if you will. They do make up my personality, just like they make up yours, because we're not perfect. As I was taught by that religion to try to be. I had no idea how to live life on life's terms. No idea. I had no idea how to get along with people out there. And yet I thought that I could be an adult. I wasn't even an adult. I was still, 
I probably was 18 years old when Mike and I got married. I was 18. Mike was 21. And I thought that this was going to be a great marriage. You see, I was already in trouble. I had nothing to do with marrying Mike. I had nothing to do with that. It's just that we kind of brought out the worst in each other. And the alcohol did that for both of us. Then I went to the doctor and I said, you know what, I cannot continue to drink like this because I, I remember a lot of times when I would go out and I would drink with Mike and he'd say, do you want another drink? And I'd say, Mike, I'm just working on this first one and you've already gone through three or four and my nose is numb and my toes are tingling and I don't think I can walk from here back to the restaurant. No, I don't want another drink. And you know what, he would look at me and say it very seriously and I remember these things. Well, honey, don't you know that's when you're really party? <laughs> I couldn't understand that. And I remember there were times when when I thought, what I need to do is, that, you see, I need to get rid of the problem. Like I got rid of my family. I need to get rid of the problem. The problem is Mike. Mike's not going to do what I asked him to do, so I need to get rid of Mike. So during the process of trying to get rid of him, I knew we were going to be moving soon. We were going to be moving, you know, that geographical look location that everything's going to change, you geographically move and everything's going to be fine. And he said, you know, if we just move up to Westfield out of the city, we move to the country, we get Michelle into a better school, things will be fine, honey. I won't drink so much. I won't be under so much stress. And things will be better. It will be fine. Because I always threatened that I was going to leave him. Always. And you know what? I didn't have anywhere to go. Remember that family? I couldn't go back. It would be like telling my mom she was right. So I had nowhere to go. So I said, okay. All right. We'll try. We'll try. We'll try again. We'll try again. And Mike would patch up the furniture, and he would patch up the bullet hole wall, uh, the, the bullet hole that were left in the walls. We became real good at cleaning up our house. And I really thought, and there again, fantasy world. If you don't talk about it, if you if you say it doesn't exist, it's not happening. In my mind, it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. So we moved. And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to get a job. And I'd already had a job, but it wasn't really a good paying job. But if I get a better paying job, then I'll be able to afford to stay in this house, and we'll just kick Mike out. Just kick his smelly ass out. <laughs> so, that's what I proceeded to try to do. And in the meantime, what happened is that I stopped going out to the bars. But the doctor gave me some these little pills. Oh, I did abuse alcohol and I did abuse pills. Because those pills and the alcohol numbed the way I felt. And helped me live in that fantasy world that it's going to get better or we'll just get rid of him and then it will be better because the problem will be gone. All this time we've got a daughter growing up. I don't know where she is a lot of times. Of course, she tells me today that I knew exactly where she was. She said, Mom, you would keep me locked up in my bedroom until I was 21 if you could. And, of course, her father chimes in and agrees with her. You know, that helps me a lot. <laughs> I remember that during this time, I had met this gal that this, at, at this particular white-collar bar where I would visit quite often mainly on Friday nights, because Friday night is a fight. At Friday night at our house, there were Friday night fights. You know, we would just, if we, if we had an open invitation coming to the Smith home for the Friday night fight, they would, we could fill the house. But Dottie happened to be in this, she had, I met her at this bar that I frequented. And then I didn't see her for a long time. And then one day, when I was trying to work myself up, be a better paying job and I was doing that slowly but surely she was walking down the hallway of this office and I said to her Dottie where have you been and she said well I've just been out of town I said well let's go out to lunch and we did I said, and then a few days went by a week would go by or two weeks I don't know I said well let's go out to dinner and one thing I noticed about Dottie she was quite a heavy drinker I could never keep up with her she didn't order a glass of wine as I did and uh, 
I wasn't drinking too much now because now the alcohol just turned me, mm-hmm. made me sick. Not, not only physically, but mentally. And I said, Dottie, how, how come you, how come you're not drinking? And she said, say, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know all those things you've been telling me about the problems that you're having and what you're planning on doing? She said, you know what I think? I think that maybe there's a drinking problem there. I can't tell you if my alcoholic or not. But she says, you know what, maybe there's a problem. Would you like to come to an open AA meeting with me? You know, Dottie, I think I would. And I went to that open AA, open AA meeting and there was a lady that was talking about her feelings, about the fear, and what she did to cover up the fear and the resentment. And I'm thinking, God, could I be one of those? Because I did that. But when she went on further about it, she didn't really like the control. And I thought, you know what? I thought I hated losing was the control. It didn't take me very long to know that I wasn't the alcoholic. But I certainly did abuse the alcohol, and I certainly did abuse other the, the, the pills that I mixed with the alcohol. And I wasn't doing any of that anymore. I was really focusing on what I need to do for myself and for Michelle. And I was going to try this one last thing. But when she talked about God, oh no, oh no, this isn't, this isn't going to work. Because now, you know that religion I told you about? We hadn't been to that church for maybe 12, 13, 14 years. I hadn't prayed to God in that many years. And I was pissed off at God. He didn't help me. He didn't help me with a problem. I prayed to him many a times. If you'll get Mike to stop drinking, I'll do this. Or if you do this for me, I'll do this. God wouldn't help me. No, I wouldn't talk to God at all. But what I thought I would do is that I would pick up all the literature that they had free at that meeting. And I would take it home and I would decorate the house with it. And he would pick it up, Fantasy World. Pick it up, read it, and by God, honey, you know I'll stop drinking. I'll go to that a and That didn't happen. I also remember something else that happened to me that night. You know, I was so full of anger, I remember I was crying, very emotional. You know how we do now after meetings? We go someplace and we have coffee and we have a meeting after the meeting. Well, this is exactly what they did. And I really didn't want to do this because I was so angry and I was I looked a mess. My eyes were swollen from from crying so much and all I really wanted to talk about was how to get Mike to stop drinking I didn't you know I sober wasn't in my, it wasn't in my vocabulary nor was, nor was alcoholic anonymous this young man said to me say I'm not even sure if he called me say he said you can't you, know, you, you can't Get your husband sober. But you can do something for yourself. There's a program called Alana you can go to. I cannot repeat up here what I said to him. <laughs> First of all, he should mind his own business. Second of all, he doesn't know me from Adam, and he doesn't even know Mike, and he doesn't even know what I'm going through, and I've always been over backwards for him, and now I have to do something else? No. No way. Remember that home we were living up, that brand new home? I left that meeting with that little bit of literature and for four more years, four years, I did it my way. And I'm telling you, it's amazing if you don't ask for God's help, you're certainly not going to get it. This disease is a progressive disease. I don't care if you've been affected by somebody else who's drinking or if you're an alcoholic. It progressed big time in our home. The violence escalated. I never will forget one time I was sitting down in our meeting and this woman said to me, well, why would you stay with a man who beats you? And you know what? All I could say to her was that I was just as sick, if not sicker than him. And I'm going to tell you something. I provoked a lot of the violence that went on in our home. I caused a lot of the violence that went on in our home. I realize that today. The times that I got in his face and he said, don't get in my face, I did anyway. And then there were times, you know how you peek through the blinds and then you shut the blinds and you run and you hop into bed? I did that a few times, but very few because then I thought that would make me seem like a, a wuss and I didn't want to be a wuss. I wanted to be strong. 
tell him I knew what was best. I'm going to relate one incident that happened that was really a, a moment of clarity for me. It's not a pretty sight. And I don't do this to embarrass Mike or myself, but I do this to tell you where I was. So many, many times when the violence would occur, Michelle would get between Mike and I and she would try to separate us. Many times she would call the police because she couldn't separate us. But this one particular time she could not. And I know she called the police because it certainly wasn't me and it certainly wasn't Mike. And the next thing I know, there was a doc at, knock at the door and I was a mess. I had blood all through my hair. It was matted. Mike was out in the patio cleaning windows, the patio window doors, the patio doors. Many, many a times we had made trips to the emergency room, either for him or either for me. And after a while, we just said, you know, we don't really care what you put down. If I fell up the steps one week or fell down the steps the next. But this particular time, there was no need to go to the hospital. The police officer came in and he pointed his finger at me. He didn't even talk to Mike for a long time. I don't even know if he talked to Mike. What I remember is that he talked to me. He got my attention. He said, lady, you are just as responsible as he is. Because look what you are doing to her. And her was Michelle curled up in a fetal position on the left seat. Crying. For the first time, I was responsible. You see, I could have left that marriage any time, but I, I wasn't desperate enough. I wasn't ready to do anything. Because, see, I wanted the alcoholic. I didn't want to have to go to the any, any length. Shortly thereafter, I said, Mike, on one night, he was going to work off at 3.30, I asked him, would you come home sober tonight? Now, it's amazing how we look at things today in recovery. I should have questioned if you have to ask your husband to come home, come home sober, there's a problem. And he said, well, sure, baby, what time? What time you want me to be here? I'll be here. I said, 5 o'clock. He said, okay, I'll be there by 5 o'clock. We'll take the kids out for pizza and to a show. And I, you know, fantasy, okay, that'll be great. 5 o'clock came and went, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9, maybe about 11 or 12 o'clock, Mike strolls in. Foul mood. I'm in a foul mood. And Michelle could have absolutely crawled underneath the rug. She was so embarrassed. And the little girl that was standing beside her or behind her, Elkie, she didn't come from this kind of family. She came from a good family, and she was shocked. She had never seen an alcoholic. She'd never seen a drunk. And here Mike is standing there with his jacket on and no shirt. And I said, Mike, where is your shirt? And he looks at me in this cocky way. And he said, huh, I guess I puked on it. And I thought, you so and so. And I got in his face. We only had words that night, because I'll tell you what. It was the next day that I decided I'm taking a toothbrush for Michelle, myself, and a change of clothes, and we're leaving. Because by this time I knew somebody was going to get killed. Somebody, because now we had loaded guns in the house. And I never will forget, there was one time I went looking for the gun. I found the gun. I went looking for the shells, couldn't find the shells. And it wasn't too very long ago that I found the shells. However, I know where the shells are. And I remind Mike every now and then where they are. <laughs> there, it's always wise to keep them on your toe, on their toes. <laughs> so I left. I had no idea where I was going to go. And there was a friend that took Michelle and I in. And she helped me get an attorney. And I called a locksmith. And I got a restraining order, and we're going to speed things up real fast. I get back in the home. He's moving somewhere on the east, living somewhere on the east side on a dirty mattress, and I could care less. 
Now I've got the new house, and that's the way it should be. And I've got the garage door opener, and I've changed everything, and I I had to meet him probably several weeks later at, a, at the court hearing. And I'm going to tell you something that I saw for the very, very first time in the 16 years that we've been married. I'd never seen this before. By the time we were separated, Mike was not eating food at all. Now, he was just drinking, and he, he couldn't even keep his clothes on. And Mike's a little guy anyway, and I look at the back of his pants, and it's like his ass is moved out. <laughs> you know? There was nothing there to grab a hold of. <laughs> but here was the most important thing that I noticed. His eyes were clear. His smile was from ear to ear. And he was happy. And I couldn't figure out what was the change. Here we're going to see the judge about getting this divorce. What was the change? Here's what he told me. I didn't even have to ask him. He was in such a way he wanted to let me know that he was going to A&A. And I thought, big deal. And that's what I said. Why couldn't you have done that before when I'd asked you to do it? When, when we realized that alcohol was a problem, that you couldn't drink the way I drank, why didn't you go to A&A then? And I said, by the way, your friend at, at, uh, at work called me and told me that you were going to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, again, I can't tell you from here what I said to that guy, but I've since made amends to him. And I said, Mike, I'm going to tell you something. It's not going to last. You're, you're just pulling another con job on me. It's not going to last. A few weeks go by, and you know, pre-Alanon, we start feeling guilty. And I'm thinking, you know what? His mom and dad don't even know that he really is alcoholic. And they'll never forgive me, because they blame me for his alcoholism anyway. They said, you know, if he didn't buy the booze, he wouldn't drink. And if you'd go back to that church, he'd follow you. Well, do you know what? His aunt called me, and she says, Faye, you know what? He's, he's doing what you want him to do. He stopped drinking, and he's going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am so afraid he's going to get in trouble with these people he's hanging out with. Why don't you let him come back home? I call him up on the phone, and I said, Mike, would you like to come home? And he said, yes, I would like to come home. And I said, okay. So he's come on back home, right? Nine months we go through this. Nine months. And he's going to these A&A meetings every night. And I say to him, Mike, this is just like cheering you with a bar. You're never home. You're never there. We don't talk. And you know what? That first year is real hard for an alcoholic, and I didn't know that. See, again, I've, I have not done anything for me, about me. It is not my problem. I didn't want a part of you guys anyway, you men and women in AA. I'm not going to take responsibility for this, but Mike did start drinking again. But I will take responsibility for what I'm about to tell you. I did not give him any support at all while he was going to AA the first nine months. My mouth was attached to that doorknob many, a many a times as he was going to the meeting. And there were these women in AA that were calling him. And, you know, I didn't appreciate that. You know, you, you might think that's funny, but really, because I, I, I didn't know about you guys, and I didn't trust women anyway. You know, I just, I just kind of gave you a general way. You know, I didn't go into details. So I didn't trust women. Mike stopped going to AA. He drank again. And I remember on December the 26th, I believe it was, 1981. I didn't know he was passed out on the bathroom floor. And I go in and I'm, I kind of storm in because I'm mad, you know. It's the day after Christmas. And I open that door and I hit his head. He's passed out on the floor. And I, now he tells me I said this, and I swear to God I don't remember saying that. I looked down at him, and I said, you know what you have to do. And he said, you did it in a very calm, loving way. That doesn't sound like me. <laughs> but if he said I did it, I want to be an angel sometimes. Then evidently I did it. I do know this. He was right back in the RNAA. 
same thing over again every single night. Now pay attention to what I'm about to share with you. One particular Wednesday night, he's going to a 12-step meeting. It's a closed meeting. I never wanted to go to the open meetings or the closed meetings, and I didn't know the difference between them, and I didn't know about these 12 steps, which he started to talk about, and I'm thinking this is lingo, and I don't understand this God part, and I don't like this God part. I was so angry this particular Wednesday night, and he says, I'm going to go to the meeting tonight. And I said, no, you're not. And he said, yes, I am. I said, Mike, no, you're not. And I stand in front of the door. Say, I need to go to this meeting. I need to do it this time for me. You don't understand. It means my life. I have never, ever been this angry as I was that night. And let me describe to you how angry I was. I was so angry, rageful, that I did not see Mike standing in front of me. Do you know what it means when you say that you're so angry that you foam at the mouth? You know that white stuff? Did you hear? That white stuff was there and it was flying. You know, as I'm screaming and yelling at Mike. I, I was, I, I can imagine what I look like. Certainly not like I look today. He was in such a hurry to go to his meeting that he said, I'm going, and shut the door kind of calmly. I didn't try to stop him, didn't get physical, which surprised me. But I remember this, when he shut the door calmly, I turned around and I looked to the heavens and I said, God, please help me. I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. What am I going to do? See, he's got something now, and I don't have anything, and I'm lonely, and I'm afraid. I went into his room, and guess what he left behind? This book. I love this book. And for every girl I sponsor, they read the first 164 pages of this book. And I said, you know what? There's got to be something here for me. So I looked in the contents of this book, and there is. There's something there perfectly for me. Chapter 8, and it's entitled, Why? I wasn't any more in the second paragraph, and there came a calmness over me like I had never felt before. And it told me in that chapter what I was doing. And it described me as an animal on a treadmill. And you see, just as I thought that I got the solution, that I could fix it, I thought it was at the top, and guess what happened? I fell right back down in exhaustion, in exhaustion trying to fix for 16 years, trying to fix, trying to control. It was my responsibility, don't you see? When I got to the end of that chapter, it did tell me that there was a program of recovery. Where do you think that they told me to go? Remember four years prior, that man I got so angry? How and I. And you know what they said? And good luck to you. And if you can go along with your husband on a spiritual plane, do so. My God, I wasn't even close to a spiritual plane. What's that? It's very important that your husband help other alcoholics. This work will help him stay sober. Oh. If the two of you can do that, together, you will be so very happy. Good luck to you. It was either that Friday night or the next Friday night. You see, this was on a Wednesday. I was in my very first Allen on me. And I stayed in that meeting for like six months saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this to myself. And then I bought my one day at a time book. And I put my date in there because I'll tell you, the date of June the 25th of 1982 was the day that I decided I'm going to work on me. And I knew that when I was in my very first down on meeting that I would never, ever, ever have to be lonely again if I chose not to. That this was a place for me. My God, a place for me. I've been looking for this place my whole life. They told me about the three C's. I didn't cause this. My God, what a freedom. 
I can't control it, which I've been doing for 16 years, and I can't cure it. Only another alcoholic can help an alcoholic. And say, you need to leave Mike to the alcoholics, and you need to go across the hall. And you know, that's what they lovingly told me. And God is so good to me, because you see, for like a year I was in a group, and now I'm meeting, that wasn't really helpful. We talked about the steps and the sponsors, but they didn't tell me how to work the steps, and I wasn't about to get a sponsor because there wasn't any female unique enough to go with my unique personality that I wanted to choose as a sponsor. <laughs> So then I would sit in these meetings, and and I was powerless over alcohol, or I wouldn't be sitting in those rooms. That wasn't too hard for me to accept that. And by that time, I was so exhausted that really, I really didn't want anything to do with the alcoholic. I really wasn't even sure if Mike and I were going to make it. You see, you do have to grow along spiritual lines. You do have to grow to trust one another again. You do have to grow to learn about one another again and to learn and to love one another again. See, we didn't even really know one another. I finally got a sponsor because I started squirming in my seat. Now they were talking about that fourth, that fifth step, you know. And I came to and I came to believe in the power greater than myself. And I stopped being so insane. But I wasn't going to do that fourth step. Then I wasn't going to do that fifth step, no. I remember sitting in a a 12-step meeting, and I kept wanting... I kind of was going to different meetings now because AAs had lovingly encouraged me to go to some workshops and say, you need to to learn about these steps, and you really do need to get a sponsor. And I I did that. And my sponsor said, let's get you involved in the 12-step workshop. But I remember when I was sitting there... I said, but I don't really have to work the fourth and fifth step, do I? Because I heard people say, you only, you just have to work the steps if you really want to work. And I remember this one lady saying to me, now that's what I heard, my fantasy world, that's what I heard. And this one lady said exactly what I wanted her to say. Say, just work those steps that you really feel comfortable. If you don't want to work the fourth and fifth, you don't have to. Now that's what I heard her say. I'm sure that's not what she said. Because I got busy, and I took that four-step inventory, and I took it the way it shows me in the fifth chapter of the big book. You know, that resentment with my mother, she was the first on my list. And all the other people, my loved ones, and some of the people that I had really harmed, you know, that I knew that I owed owed amends to. And about those things that I found objectionable in me. Boy, if that wasn't something for me to do. You know, sponsorship is a beautiful, beautiful, I look at it as a gift in this program, because really it's a commitment on both parties. It's a commitment of myself to somebody else. You know, that we're really going to get become very close. We're going to become intimately involved. We're going to discuss things that nobody else knows about us, that even the alcoholic doesn't know. And maybe that's why it suggested that we choose a sponsor of our own sex. And it was very hard for me to trust a female, remember? Very hard for me to trust another woman. This gal, I love her dearly. She she came to to realize, evidently for herself, she didn't need Alan on any longer. So I did have to get another sponsor. And then she moved, and then I had to get another sponsor. But anyway, my first sponsor, I remember when when I was sharing my fourth step with her. And there there was one thing that I really was... uh, embarrassed about and ashamed about it, and I'm not going to discuss it from the podium, but I remember I, I, I said it real fast, and I didn't think she heard me, and she said, uh, what did you say? <laughs> so we went back, and she was very loving, and you know, I'm really not all that unique at all, but we got through that, and she loved me, and I thought she wouldn't love me, and she wouldn't respect me, and she loved me in spite of And then she says, hey, you know what? You, you need to take this program home because that's where you got sick or you don't have a problem. So when you go home and you're angry at Mike and you see him walking down the hallway and you're walking down the hallway at the same time, I want you to lean over and give him a hug. Oh, I don't want to do that. I don't care if you want to do it. You're going to do it. See, I have a sponsor that really didn't tap me on the shoulder and say, well, it's okay. She was fine. 
She told me after I, after we shared that fifth step, you know, she said, I want you to go home and I want you to spend some time. And for you, I want you to get down on your knees. And you know, it talks about that. And I'll tell you something. When I spent that time on my knees, I, I became closer to a God of my understanding than I never, ever thought possible. And I was really willing for God to remove these character defects. And in the eighth step, all I had to do was to make a list and be willing. You know, that's all. Willing to make a list. And those people were on my, on my four step inventory. And I knew the ones that I wasn't going to make amends to. There, there, there really wasn't someone that, anyone that I was never, never going to make, but the very last person that I had to make the amends to was my mother-in-law. Because you see, I had a resentment for her because she implied that I didn't love mine. And then she asked him to come home to them because that's where he was loved. And she implied that I caused this terrible, terrible disease. But since then, I think that I've become even closer to her because of the amends that I made. The ego that I have inside of me. Real quick. You know, I always wanted to meet my biological father. You know, that one I told you that I never knew, but my mother always told me about, but I never knew. I only saw a picture of him. In 1993, I was able to meet my father. He lives in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Went down, and I met my father, and uh, I know that before we actually met, he, his wife, my stepmother, asked me a strange question. She said, say, do you and Mike drink? Boy, that's a strange question. But I, that, but I had the courage to say no. Mike and I don't drink. I said, I drink socially, but really, when we're out, I really, there's no reason to have alcohol. Well, they decided to meet us on mutual ground, the Holiday Inn. And then we met in the lobby and we proceeded to the bar. And my father orders a drink and my stepmother orders a drink and my brother and my, my, my half-brother and my half-sister, they order Pepsi. Well, you know what I found out? My my father admits that he is an active alcoholic, and he is. And I can say that because he admits that he is, and he's dying in this terrible, terrible disease. And every time I call him and tell him that I love him, he slips. But we don't talk about his drink. Because one time we started to, you know, be, and there's an AA meeting right down the street from him that Mike and I have been to three times. And my dad knows that they're down there. But I'm able to tell him that I love him and just tell him that I love him and not talk about his drink. I couldn't have done that without the 12 steps of this program. You know? I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done that without making those amends and that 10 step when I'm wrong, promptly admit it to the person that I hate to do it the most to, and that's my husband, my husband. You know what? Ego. And you know what, in the 11th step, when I have a conscious contact with my Heavenly Father, every day I try to do that and meditate. It's very important to me. It's one of the hardest things for me to do. But I'm able to do that, and and it's through doing those things that I can have that relationship with my father, my stepmother, who is also dying of this terrible, terrible disease of alcoholism, my stepsister, who is also in and out of AA and having a real, real hell of a time. And my stepbrother, who's also dying of this terrible, terrible disease. And you see, I've got to know all four of them. And it's because I've had the courage, and it's through the 12 steps that I've had the courage to do that. I have another brother who lives in Owensboro, Kentucky, who probably qualifies for an We have a 32-year-old daughter. Well, she'll be 32 on Monday. When we get back to Indianapolis, I'm taking Monday off, and we're going to celebrate her birthday. Her and I are going to go out. And we have a grandson who is the light of our life, and he is helping Mike grow up. <laughs> I liked what Ernie said. And he is helping Mike grow up because Mike says, you know what? I'm looking forward to go to take him to the fishing and to share and you know what? Without AA, Michelle would have never, never entrusted us with that baby, to babysit, and to love that baby, and to be there when she gave birth to that baby. And Chad Michael Zellner is just wonderful. 
and he's walking, he's getting into heaven. And our son-in-law, what a gem. He loves Michelle so very, very much. And you know, sometimes they become very selfish about this program of AA and al because Michelle says, you know what, sometimes, Mom, I think you put that program first. You and Dad just put that program above everything. And I said, Michelle, don't you see, without that program, you wouldn't have Mom and Dad today. And I believe that. It's been the result of those 11 steps that indeed I have had a spiritual awakening. And the reason I say that, it's been those 11 steps that I have worked and I have applied to my life that I indeed am not the same person. I am not the same person. You wouldn't know that person today. It's hard probably for you to imagine that I just described what went on in our home. But that went on in our home. Today, Mike and I are trying to apply the 12 steps, the 12 traditions in our home and the concepts. I'm going to tell you something. It's hard. It's real hard for me sometimes. And I, this is a discussion that Mike and I have had before recently. And I read this in the chapter to the wives just not too long ago because, you know, I was saying, Michael, why can't you have compassion for me sometimes? And imagine that I am that new alcoholic that you're working with instead of just your wife for 32 years. When you become gruff with me and selfish with me. And you know what it tells me in chapter 8? That I should not criticize. That I need to take a look at my side of this relationship and work on that. And the marriage, the dilemma of the alcoholic marriage, what a great book to read. For me. You see, because I need to apply those things if, if I want any results. And my sponsor says, and don't you dare expect any results. I'm going to close with a little story. And I, I, I tried to say, uh, tell this story in Little Rock. and I got it wrong. And you know, nobody else probably knew I got it wrong except for my husband. And he says, you know what? He said, when you tell a story, make sure you get the facts right. And that hurt me. And it... And it kind of embarrassed me because I didn't feel good anyway. But I'm going to read it to you because I want to get it perfect. <laughs> this is about a conversation that God had with a man who wanted to know the difference between heaven and hell. God took him in this room and there was a long table with the most wonderful food in the world that you could ever want. These people were in anguish. They were suffering because they had three foot handle spoons and they could not get these spoons up to their mouths to feed themselves. And they were dying and they were stark in the midst of time. And God took them in another room and it was identical the same way. It was set up exactly the same way. But these people were happy, joyous, and free because they had learned the secret of life. For if they leaned across the table, they could feed one another. And you know what? We are continually here for one another. And we feed one another. And we practice these principles in all our affairs. And I can see you out there, my friends, my large, large family who I love. If I see you practicing these principles and you're working these 12 steps and these traditions and concepts, then I want to be just like you. And for that, I will, I'm forever grateful. God bless you, and thank you so very much for having me tonight. I love you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.